it really is my absolute delight to introduce Stevie Shepherdson tonight. She is one of the gang that helps run Sidebar for us. We had to persuade her just a little bit to do this tonight. Um, we, uh, we think it's important that all types of scientists at different stages in their careers and different backgrounds uh, present here, and we, we work hard to keep that mix. Uh, and I think you're going to enjoy this. We've been looking forward to it more than any of the other ones we're doing. Uh, Stevie is at the University of Chester. This is actually the, going through some of the work she did for her dissertation as part of the degree, um, which I think it's okay for me to say you got a first class for, and quite rightly so. Um, so without further ado, Stevie's going to tell you all about how you can interpret canine behaviour. Stevie, it's over to you. Thank you. So not much more to follow on with from there. I think we can wrap it up. Um, <laughs> so yeah, as Mike said, this is going to loosely be um, around my dissertation work. So firstly, hi everyone. Um, as Mike said, I'm Stevie. Some of you I'm sure I've met before at a sidebar. Um, I'm a recent graduate of Chester Uni where I studied animal behaviour and welfare. Um, I hopefully will be graduating in November, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I thought I would introduce you to my two. So this is Magic on the left and Bruce on the right. Reason why I thought I'd introduce you is because, well, they're hella cute for a start. Um, and also because I promised them both a cameo in this presentation. So I thought I'd introduce you now. So, you know, and you can see them later on. So let's get cracking. So my dissertation. So here's a snapshot of a questionnaire that I created on Google Forms. So I created an online questionnaire um, and I sent this out via social media um, on places like Facebook and I reached over uh, 400 adults in the UK. Um, and the online questionnaire contained three video clips showing three different dogs interacting with a child. Different child in each clip, different scenario, different dog. Um, and they were only short clips. And I asked the participants to answer after each video and tell me how they believed the dog in each video clip was feeling. So they had a list of words to choose from, such as happy, hungry, anxious, nervous, confident. You'll see the list a little bit later on. You guys will get to choose from it as well. Um, and they chose that. And then these video clips were also assessed by a dog be behavior professional, another lecturer from the University of Chester. So they were pre-assessed um, and she determined the behavior of each dog in the clip. And the idea was that I would then compare the answer of the participants to her answers and see if they either were correct or incorrect. So I asked them two really important questions as well. And one was, do you hold any qualifications associated with animal beh behavior? So this could have been anything from a diploma in maybe dog grooming or animal behavior all the way up to veterinary surgery um, and everything in between really. Anything where you have to have learned a little bit about animal behavior and not just dog behavior but animal behavior in general. And then the other question that I asked them was do you currently own or have you owned a dog at some point? And they had five options here so it was yes I currently own, no never, in the last five years I have, or it was more than five years ago, but yes. And the reason why I did this is because my whole dissertation was going to investigate whether having some theoretical background knowledge of animal behavior would increase the success um, of, get, of answering correctly to these videos and interpreting the behavior of the dogs correctly. Um, in terms of compar comparing it to what we call an expert. And then also seeing whether having any canine experience increased success. So this was again, ownership of a dog. Um, and this has been investigated before, but the studies found very varying answers. So I almost wanted to contribute to the already existing pool of data on this one. So I was basically investigating knowledge versus experience. They're very different things. Um, but the reason why is because we come across phrases like this a lot in animal behavior. 
such as I've had dogs all my life, therefore X, Y, and Z. Um, and the problem with this is that it doesn't necessarily make you an expert on the subject. There's no doubt it helps, but I heard an argument to this, which will stick with me forever, which was I've had hair all my life, but that doesn't make me a hairdresser. And it's the same for I've had a car since I was 17, doesn't necessarily make me an, a mechanic sort of thing. So no doubt the experience is going to help, but it doesn't necessarily make us an expert. Um, and as scientists, we know we can always learn. So why dogs? I absolutely love dogs. I'm obsessed with them. And as a nation, apparently we are as well. So there's, there's about 9 million pet dogs um, in the UK at the moment. Now, this is an estimate from the last two years of data. And these are registered pet dogs. So, of course, we're not taking into account the unregistered ones, uh, perhaps ones in rescue centres and even stray dogs. So this number probably could be a little bit higher. Um, but again, it's just an estimate. Um, in the US, it's something like 65 million. Um, in Europe, I think in the 30 million range. So like worldwide, they're a popular pet. But in the UK, we definitely love our dogs. So why then are so many of them being, re um, being surrendered to rescue centres each year? There's over 100,000 a year, it's estimated. And again, this doesn't take into account the ones that are rehomed privately. Um, so via Gumtree or, or such. Um, so why? why? Why do people rehome their dogs? So I thought I'd give you a few examples. These are real life reasons why people in the UK have rehomed their dog. And I'm sure as you'll be seeing, some of them are a little bit out there and a little bit difficult to believe actually, but this actually formed part of a campaign by the Dogs Trust, I think they on 10 years ago now. And these are real reasons why people in the UK have given up their dog. My particular favorite is he was just too perfect. I imagine sort of being in a, in a kennel and being like, oh, what are you in for? And he says, oh, I, I bit my owner's leg clean off. Um, what about you? He says, oh, I was just too perfect. Like it's, it's ridiculous, <laughs> it really is. Um, but there are genuine reasons, um, you know, reasonable reasons why someone may um, give up their dog. And actually the, the most common one that we see is this. So perceived behavioral problems. And perceived is a really important word here because more often than not, they're actually just behaviors, um, maybe undesirable behaviors to some. So for example, barking. All dogs, well, the majority of dogs bark. It's a normal canine behavior. It's a form of communication. Um, and it's really important. It lets you know when there's someone at the gate, someone at your house. Um, it, you know, it, it's worthwhile letting them have that communication. It becomes a problem or a problem behavior when it's excessive or it's inappropriate. So we want dogs to bark, but we also want them to can it when we ask them to as well. But this one is actually another common one. So here we've got a Rhodesian Ridgeback puppy. I think it's a Rhodesian Ridgeback. If anyone can correct me, please do. This is just a guess. So this is quite often seen when people relinquish their dogs is that hard mouthing or biting. And unfortunately, it's actually being labeled as aggression. I'm not to say that sometimes these dogs aren't aggressive, but the majority of the time, it's just an outward expression of play. And some studies have actually found that owners are struggling to differentiate between play behaviors and aggression and which is a problem and this is in dog owners and we are we are certainly misinterpreting this behavior and that is evident in the figures so there's over 6,000 cases of dog related injury that are reported in the UK and that was in just one year and this was quite a while ago so the likelihood of this increasing is quite high but also keep in mind that the majority of dog bite or dog related injuries go unreported. So this is probably a really low ballpark figure. For example, this hospital, this is one in Liverpool. This is just one hospital with over 400 children that are admitted. 
So of all the dog bites that are recorded in UK hospital data, the majority of them, I'm talking over 70% of them are to children. And most of them are children under 12. So small, small children. So particularly at risk. Um, and we're finding that of the ones that occur to children, around 60% of them are in the presence of their parent, which is a little bit shocking really when you think that parents are supposed to be the supervising body we're supposed to keep children safe so there's definitely some misinterpretation by the adults as well as the children so why 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 are we getting this so wrong where are we going wrong so i thought we would put it to the test tonight so this is where you guys get a chance to give your opinion um, and you actually get to sample what was in my dissertation. So I'm going to show you a video and it's of a Siberian Husky with a toddler. And I want you guys, after this video clip is played, you'll be prompted to answer with, you'll just choose one of the words which you think best describes how the dog in this clip is feeling. So I'm going to play the clip now and let's watch and see. Kiss him, Mary, kiss him. Kiss Husky. No, kiss, hug, hug, hug Husky. Hug Husky. Go hug Husky. Hug him. Okay, so um, Mike, if you want to throw up the prompt. Um, yeah, so you should see a list come in front of you about now, so you can, should be able to vote. There's 10 options. So, can you see them? Yep, yeah, I've seen mine, hopefully everyone else has. Don't know how Harry's going to vote, given he's riding a bike at the moment. <laughs> Fair play, that is skills. <laughs> I think the kid's sick of your bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Don't influence the outcome. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna... Hang on, just wait a second. We've got 16. So you and I aren't voting, so when we, we should be about there. 16 of 19 have voted. Do you want to see them? Um, yeah, give everyone... I think we're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. See? Yeah, throw them up. So hopefully everyone should be able to see this. Can you see um, them? Yeah, that's great. So we've got 56% that said anxious, 13% uh, said indifferent, 6% said relaxed, and 25% said nervous. Okay, so I think, Mike, are you going to jot those down? I'll keep a note of them. They do stay, I think. Well, I they do they stay. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so I'm going to close this down. Cool. So let's break the clip down and have a bit of a closer look. So here we've got the dog pulling away the head um, and we've got these really wide eyes. It's kind of hard to tell on this dog because his eyes are blue. He or she's eyes are blue. Um, but regardless, throughout the clip, the eyes are quite wide. 
Then we've got this licking behavior. Aside from this, a little bit further on in the clip, you would have seen lip licking, which is something I'll go into a little bit later. But sometimes licking in this context can be classed as appeasement. So it's kind of like, if I lick you, will you leave me alone kind of thing? And then we've got this, we've got a bit of showing teeth, not in, not in such an aggressive way, but we've got a mouth open and the ears are back. And again, those eyes are wide, just staring at this child and they're pulling their head back as in like, get away from me. And at some point the dog goes and lies down, does a stretch, does some yawning. Um, and these three words at the bottom here are what the dog behavior expert classed this dog as feeling. So if you chose one of these words, you got it right. Um, and you were successful. Um, but yeah, pretty anxious behavior, nervous and a little bit fearful as well. So uh, let's have a look how you compared to my study. So in my study, again, as I said before, I looked at ownership status and qualification status. So if we look at the ownership status first, of those who owned a dog, compared to those who have never owned a dog, um, we saw a much higher success rate, which is kind of expected. Um, but then in the never owned category over here, we see a higher percentage of those who answered incorrectly compared to the ownership. So that's quite important to remember. And then if we look at qualification status, we saw a much higher um, incorrect answer in the unqualified category than we did in the qualified category. And again, that, that's pretty much to be expected. But whilst it is a, a quite a large increase to the eye, it's not what we would call statistically significant. So, what sort of behavioural markers helped you to decide that dog's behaviour? There will be things that you were looking at in the clip which helped you to decide. And I want you to consider this when you're looking at this next graph. So I asked people to, to list what, what it was that made them decide. And then from that list, I made these categories of mouth, eyes, head, ears. There were tail, um, the whole body, uh, lips, that, that sort of thing. Um, but these were the ones that actually answered to this one. So the majority of people who answered correctly use the head. So it would have been that pulling away motion. Um, and the eyes, again, those wide staring eyes and the ears, which were quite far back as well. Um, so that, that's pretty much to be expected. Hopefully, if you answered correctly, you picked up on those as well. So just remember where, just have a look at where you think you perhaps fit into, the, into these numbers here. So is it worth having a break now or would you guys prefer to continue? Entirely I think it's always good to have the quick 10 minute break at this point. So, um, yeah. Please help. Give you a chance to visit Lou, grab a, a fresh drink, whatever. We'll be back in 10 minutes. So we'll start at five past eight. And, uh, when we get back, there will be a little bit of game show activity as well. So, yeah, there's even more fun to come. So go away and reflect on your choices. I hope everyone's got topped up glasses. Oh uh, yeah, I'm sure this is going to be a very good bit of the recording, 10 minutes of silence. But thank you for putting questions into the chat box. Uh, it's great to see some coming in and um, please do, particularly if there's something that uh, Stevie raises that you want to follow up or, or if they've got particular questions. Let's test her. Not too hard, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Stevie, it's high past, back over to you. Okay, so... In the next bit, we're going to look at a few behavioural cues. So we're going to look at dog body language and look at we're going to sort of look at piece by piece what we can use to interpret the behaviour. So just before we do that, this is a little piece of research that I found, which was um, over a thousand dog owners um, were surveyed and it was found that they actually struggled to pick up on really subtle signs of stress in their own dogs. And this was things like yawning, lip licking, and avoiding eye contact. So this was in over a thousand dog owners. Um, and that's just one particular study. So why is that important? So if we have a look at this, this was made quite nicely by um, a veterinarian called Dr. Shepherd. It's called the Canine Ladder of Aggression. I'm not too keen on the name myself, um, just because 
I think it may have been more aptly named the canine ladder of stress, just because down at the bottom here, these signs are quite anxious behaviours, and then we progress up through, um, which you'll see now. The idea here is that each rung in the ladder is uh, represents a trigger or a stressor. So something in your, your dog's environment, which causes the release of cortisol, the stress hormone. Um, and if these happen in quick succession without giving the chance, uh, giving the dog the chance to calm down and recover from the stress, um, the dog will progress up through the rungs in the ladder as depicted here, going and showing each of these little behaviors on the way. And if um, that stress isn't removed and it continues to culminate and build up, it will it could eventually end in a bite. The idea here then being if we remove the stress, we're going to avoid being bitten. Because dogs don't dogs give us quite a, a large leeway if you know what to look for. Dogs tend to bite last. They'll give us quite a few warning signs um, which are depicted here. But biting is generally a last resort because it's quite risky for them. If you think about it from an, um, a survival point of view, um, biting is um, you know, it's confrontational, it's it's starting something and it's risky. So a bite is really a last resort. Um, and it's these little subtle signs at the bottom, things like licking their lips continually, turning their head away um, and avoiding eye contact sort of thing, like um, I don't want to be confrontational, I want to avoid any confrontation. And um, it's those sort of things that we aren't quite picking up on. And we're actually relying on these um, more obvious behaviours, things like um, cowering, um, growling, and they're really high up on, on the ladder of aggression here. So it means that we're not giving ourselves much of a chance to interpret this behaviour before it potentially ends in a bite, which may be the reason why those statistics are quite high. And if we were a bit more perceptive or a bit more successful in interpreting the behaviour down in the further lower um, region, we may be able to um, mediate a bite. So that's the idea there. So let's look at some of the actual uh, physiological signs. So we're looking at um, the mouth in particular here. Now context is extremely important, um, no matter what body part you're looking at. So for example, yawning. If your dog's just woken up, it's probably going to yawn like all of us do. Um, it's probably not that unusual for a dog to yawn when it when it wakes up or the same as when it's, you know, getting ready for, for bed. So yawning can be normal, but you've got to think about what, what the position is. If you've just taken your dog to the vet and you're sat in the waiting room and your dog is continually yawning every couple of minutes, that can be a sign of stress. And the same with lip, lip, lip licking. And it, especially if you see these two behaviours together. So if you see yawning, it's intermittently with lip licking in between. So it's a pretty good sign that your dog's experiencing a little, little bit of anxiety and a little bit of stress. Now showing teeth is particularly interesting because I was always taught that it's the amount of teeth that a dog shows, which is a good indicator of, of whether it is fear or it's aggression. So I was taught that the more teeth a dog shows when it bears its teeth, the more frightened it is. And if you think about this in terms of, I don't know if you've ever seen a fear smile that a dog will do. If they lay down their ears are back and they'll show you all their teeth, it kind of looks, some people think it's almost funny and comical. But then if you compare that to a snarling dog, which only shows you up to the canines, that's quite offensive. That is quite, don't come any further because this is not gonna end well for you. But I did want to show you this little clip here because this video was called Very Angry Dog. And I just want to talk you through it. And hopefully the audio is not too loud on it um, and you can still hear me sort of talk over it. But there's a couple of bits I want to pick out with you. It's a home video I found on YouTube after hours of searching. So this dog, if we think about that ladder of aggression, it's barking, it's moving, it's moving back and forth, so it's moving offensively and then running back to its owner, to its safe spot. Its tail is tucked under its bum, under its rump, and it's snapping, it's air snapping. Now if you remember back to that canine ladder of aggression, those are really high up 
um, they're, they're just under a bite response. But, but if we were seeing true aggression, this dog wouldn't be stopping. It would be over the back of that sofa and it would be latched onto someone's arm. But the fact that it's constantly running back to its owner and its tail's tucked and it's constantly looking to escape that confrontation and whatever threat it is, it's likely the person, you know, encouraging the behavior to, for the sake of the film. It's, it's actually fear, <laughs> it's insecurity, and it's the fact that this dog doesn't want anything to do with it. So it's, it's almost running away from it. So I did mention the tail just. There's two really important things to consider when you think about the tail. One is the height that the tail's at, and the other is the speed of the wag, if there is a wag. So if we look at a nice golden retriever, these are a really nice example because they've got quite a long tail, basically. <laughs> it's quite easy to uh, decipher their behavior. And quite often with golden retrievers, you'll see a really nice, steady swish of a tail, usually a medium carriage, about this height that you can see here. That's pretty indicative of, of a happy dog or, or a relaxed dog. Um, but quite often people think that a, a wagging tail equals a happy dog. And it's, it's not quite as simple as that. So if you look here, the tail's really tucked under the rump of this dog. And quite often you'll see the end of the tail moving quite rapidly. This is a fear response. And again, you can see that classic lip licking in this little clip here. The only thing is I would not be recommending to stroke this dog here because this dog doesn't want to be touched. It, it, the best thing you could do to relieve some stress in this dog is to ignore it, in my opinion anyway. And then we've got this one here. So the polar opposite, this tail, uh, it's kind of hard with the angle, but this tail is bolt upright. It's being held. You can almost feel the twitch in this picture, but it is held bolt upright. Um, and that's usually a sign of um, overstimulation. So it's really energetic, it's really stimulated. But there's a bit of a, a, of a catch here because breed specifics is really important to consider. Some dogs naturally have a tail with a high carriage. So Akitas, Pomeranians, um, Samoyeds, dogs like that with, with the naturally high carriage. So it can be a bit hard to interpret that. But the wag can quite often give that away. If it's a really rapid wag, it means it just means overstimulation. It's really stimulated um, and that can be positive or negative. So let's have a look at the eyes. This is a particular video which I hated when it circulated but no doubt you'll hear the laughter in the video. So this is whale eye, really nice example, not a nice example, terrible example of it. So hopefully this plays okay. We've got a Bernese mountain dog I believe being shown a hamster and you can see the whites of his eyes. Um, and can you see that classic lip licking? And again, something that we that we see um, in there as well. He's avoiding it, having a quick sniff, saying, what the hell is that? Um, but again, he's pulling his head away. You can see the whites of his eyes. He wants nothing to do with that hamster. Um, and yet it's being forced into his face. So I remember this one circulating because people thought it was hilarious at the time. But this dog is so stressed. And it's, it's very patient because... You could easily say a different dog in a different situation, poor outcome for the hamster. So that avoiding eye contact. So a lot of the time what a dog will do is if you're threat, if it's seen a threat, it will try and look at it from the, its peripheral vision and it will, so it wants to keep its eye on it. But eye contact in dog language can be a very bold move so generally a dog which is very bold and very confident will will make eye contact and will look for that connection but a, a dog that is um say fearful or nervous will often avert a gaze because it doesn't want to start basically start any trouble it's more like i'm going to keep an eye on you from the peripheral but i'm not going to stare at you because i don't want to have that interaction and then on the flip side of that, a fixed gaze. Now, I really struggled to find any sort of media to, to sort of back this one up. But I will show you a little bit later on with, with my dog, Bruce, because he's another quite nice example of how when a dog um, is overstimulated and it fixates on whatever it is that has caused the stimulation. But I'll show you that a little bit later on. And then we've got body posture. So I've brought this picture up again because this dog is cowering or creeping. So you'll often see dogs really, really low down 
and they'll be slinking almost or they'll just not move at all. They'll try and make themselves really, really small. Um, and that's a sign of nervousness. But at the same time, um, you've got to be careful with that one and think about context again. Context is really important because it can be a sign of illness. So think about your context. If your dog's at home and it's, it's carrying, it's not wanting to get up very much, could be perhaps they've got a bit of internal pain or something like that. But if someone quite imposing has just walked into the house and they're lip licking and, you know, they're carrying down, it may be that they're afraid. So context is really important. And this whole rolling over with the leg up, again, that was on the canine aggression of ladder of aggression as well. Um, a lot of people think a dog that rolls over, oh, they want their belly scratched. I'm just going to dive in and start rustling around in the fur. And that can be quite invasive for a nervous dog. So sometimes it's better just to let the dog come to you. Shaking and stretching, again, context is really important. If your dogs, most dogs, the first thing they do when they wake up, like us humans, is they'll do a big, long stretch. They'll stretch outwards, and then they'll go backwards, and then they'll sometimes shake and sort of stretch, and that's great. That's just woke up doing a little bit of dog yoga. Some people do it. I'm not a fan personally, but maybe I should get into it. Who knows? Um, but this, again, in, the, in a particular context, can be a sign of stress. So... Again, if you think about sat in the reception at a vet, uh, a vet's surgery, and your dog's lip licking and it keeps sort of shaking, it's a way of releasing tension um, that builds up in them from that cortisol that's racing around in their body. And this is quite, again, I say nice picture, they're, they're, they're not nice images, but they're a nice way of depicting what I'm trying to explain. So we've, here we've got that really rigid high tail We've got a rigid posture and all of this dog's body weight is in the front. OK, so it's 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 leaning forward. We've got the ears pointing forward and it's fixed gaze on this other beagle. So that is quite an offensive um, posture to be in. It's quite it's it's pretty much I'm ready to go if you are. Whereas this other one here, um, we've got a, a low tail, low carriage tail. All of this dog's weight is in the back legs and that's so that it can escape it, it can spring off of its back legs and run in another direction if something looks like it's going to occur it's bearing its teeth to show that i don't want you to come any closer to me and its ears are down and low so overall you can it, this sort of shows quite nicely the difference in postures there and then another picture here again shows it quite nicely you look at this one it's carrying really low its tails tucked underneath its bum it's not making direct eye contact but it's it's still keeping a low carriage whereas this guy here is staring down this dog and um, his tails forward and again all of his weight is in his front so he's imposing he's he's confident he's ready to go um should the need arise so it's about that time um, hopefully some of you guys will know who this lovely chap is. Um, I'm a bit nervous to say that I actually do remember him. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm in that bracket now. That so we're going to have a little round of catchphrase if my laptop holds up. So. I think are people are to come off mute for this, did you say, Stevie? Um, chat function or, yeah, if you want to come off mute, it's fine. Type, type, type your thoughts in chat. Probably easier. So I put the original theme in. Yes, I, I stayed up till 2 a.m. doing this, guys. <laughs> Catherine, thank you. <laughs> so the, the idea is like, it, we're only going to do one round of this, but I thought it might make it quite fun. So behind this logo, there is a picture of a dog. And one by one, I'm going to remove a square. And I want you guys in the chat just to um, use any words that you want, really. Just pick a word, how you think the dog in this picture is feeling based on what you can see. OK, should we get going? Awesome. Five seconds. Here we go. <laughs> Mike, what we got? We got relaxed. We got crouching. 
tail up. Tail up, well done, Sean. Say what you see. <laughs> it's good, but it's not right. <laughs> You're still in my lines, Mike. <laughs> got it. Sorry, sorry. We, we got indifferent. I think mm -hmm. uh, I think we're, we need a bit more to get this catchphrase. Ah, well, seeing as you asked. Five seconds, here we go. Sorry about the watermark, but you know, when you find the right <laughs> picture, you just got to go with it. <laughs> We've got, um, so intimidating, submissive, unhappy, happy. <laughs> Polar opposite. <laughs> Relaxed. Let's go for I'm, another. I'm going to say playful. Hey, that's someone said it. <laughs> Five seconds, here we go. So I'm not giving too much away. Oh, play bowing. So a couple of people said play bowing. Mm -hmm. Excited. A lot of play bowing. Cool. Let's go for another. <laughs> Five seconds, here we go. This is what I stayed up for 2 a.m. trying to do. <laughs> oh, he is. He is well. As always, Stevie, you're, you're brilliant at presenting anything. <laughs> so what are we thinking here? Anything different from play bowing and... Alert. We've got alert. Cool. Looks happy. Harry must be off his bike because he's typing. Oh. <laughs> Either that or he's extremely skilled at no hands. Maybe he's got a voice free thing. Yeah, he is down now. It's. Mm. Let's go again. I don't know the answer to this, but. Oh. Mm. Got some eyes now. <laughs> eyes are important, one of the big telltales. Yeah. He's looking a little bit pissed off to me. He's like, he's looking like, where's his tea? Focused, wary, chill, mm -hmm. cowering, focused, attentive. I'm going to go hungry. It's usually a good default for a dog. Mike. Keen, attentive. Mike, you're going with hungry, did you say? I'm going with hungry, yeah. It's good, but it's not right. <laughs> 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 this dog's got his dinner. He's oh. afraid someone's going to come and take it. Oh. So this is a classic example of where context is really important. So, yeah, we can use the tail. The tail is a great indicator. We could use the back legs, and that's where that play bow, it did look like a play bow for quite a bit. Then we got the intense staring. Someone could have been holding a ball there for all, you know. But then the minute we get this, we get this snarl, and this is, again, just up to the canine. So we've got this fixed stare. The ears are forward. Which, which generally just means it's focus, which is, which is, I know, a word that came up there quite a lot, so well done to those. But then the minute you, you put all of these pieces together and you form that big picture, and then you put it into context at what is happening, you see the food bowl, you go, okay, we've got a stressed animal, and it's because there's food around. So this dog is likely food re or resource um, reactive. So, oh, I'm exactly the same. sorry, I'm exactly the same if someone's coming up. <laughs> As Sean says, yeah, that's his face when someone tries to steal his chips. Yeah, it's a long way around it, but it, I just wanted you guys to see that it, it, you, you've got to take these little pieces of the puzzle and put them all together to form the bigger picture and then put it into context. So I think that's about time for another test. So we've gone through quite a few of the different, um, phys you know, phys physical signs um, and we've done them qu quite in depth. Um, so maybe it's time that we did another test and see if maybe if you answered maybe incorrectly last time, see if you get it correct this time. Um, so this time we've got a Jack Russell, I believe it's a Jack Russell, interacting with a toddler. Um, so we'll play that now and then again I'll stop the video at some point and then we'll put the poll up and we can answer just after.
There you go, pet him. Yeah, good Doggy. Andrew. Doggy. <laughs> <laughs> Boy peanut. <laughs> okay, very cute. Yeah. Oh, it's so cute. So, um, if we put the poll up and then answer, and then I do I, again, I'd like to think about what physiological or what parts of the dog made you decide or helped you to decide on your answer. Getting mostly anxious here. Mm -hmm. Very similar to last time. Anxious, nervous, fearful. A couple of you to vote. Going to I'll give you a couple more seconds. Okay. Results should be on the screen now for you, Stevie. Okay. So we've got a lot more, I'd say, continuity here. So we've got quite a, a larger percentage, 41% which said anxious and 29% which said nervous and following up with that with 18% which said fearful. So yeah, um, a lot more people were agreeing there on, on the same sort of words. We have got um, a couple of issues, um, clicks on playful and indifferent as well. Um, None for the rest. Okay. So have a think about what body parts may help you to, dec to decide on your answer. And um, again, we're just going to compare perhaps your answers to um, my study. But first, we're going to break this video down as before, and we're going to look there at it in go. detail. So first, we've got panting. Um, excessive panting but again this is where context is important because we don't know if this dog has just had an hour and a half running around the garden or on a treadmill we, we, we don't know and um, this is a two minute video and this was one of the limitations of my study because the the clips were two minutes to help people to stay engaged but the fact of the matter is that that cortisol that races around um, a dog's or anyone's body really when they become stressed it can take sort of 90 minutes for that cortisol to return down to baseline so without knowing the context you know it could just be that this dog is hot or it's cooling down but the dog is constantly looking up towards its owner so then we've got this the child touches the dog and the minute that child touches the dog the dog cowers and a really important thing to look at here is that the dog has gone from panting quite excessively, quite happily panting away. And the minute that child touches that dog, its mouth closes. So there is an interaction and association there. Here we've got that classic lip licking, which we would have seen quite a bit now. And it's constantly looking to the owner. So it's looking for reassurance. And then every time this child touches this dog, we've just got that closed mouth, tense face, and the dog begins to cower. And at no point this dog makes direct contact with the child. Again, we're using the peripheral here. So he's looking around the child to, make, to see what he's doing, really, to see if he's going to be a threat. But he's never making direct eye contact. We've even got flinching in there. You know, the minute the child goes up towards the head, we've got a flinching, horrifically tense face. And then we've got stretching. So if you remember further back, that stretching out, um, yawning behavior, um, it's a way of relieving that tension. And considering how tense the dog was in terms of cowering and things like that, it's a good indication that this dog is anxious. 
So anxious and nervous. So this is these two words here is what the um, dog behavior expert um, plus this dog is feeling in this clip. So think about the way that you answered. Think about whether you perhaps chose one of these words. Um, and again, we're going to look at now um, what parts of the body helped people to decide on their answer. So this is the, again, I looked at qualified and unqualified. So we had a, a much higher percentage here of unqualified people answering incorrectly to this video, which again, it's a much higher percentage, but it's not what we would say is significantly significant. And then here with the ownership status, interestingly, we have a much higher percentage of owners answering incorrectly. We also have a high percentage of, of people who have never owned a dog getting this incorrect, which could be expected. But interestingly, it's actually the owners, more of the owners are answering incorrectly to this particular video. So I wanted to know why, what was making people answer incorrectly or misinterpret that behavior if you like. So those that answered correctly use the panting and the lips or lip licking most often to interpret this dog's behavior. And those are those telltale signs. So excessive panting, we don't necessarily know the context, but compare, um, couple that with lip licking and you've got a pretty good idea. And then you've got the ears, the head and the eyes. Now, what is interesting here is that of those people who answered correctly, no one chose the tail. However, of those who answered incorrectly, the majority of them chose the tail. So that means that people who are answering incorrectly are choosing something completely different to what people who answer incorrectly are choosing. And the reason why the tail is particularly important in this clip is for two reasons. Well, well, sorry, more than two reasons, really. One is that you can hardly see the tail in the clip at all, um, which suggests that people are looking for the tail. So they're looking to the tail to, for help. They're like, well, maybe if I can see the tail, I'll know what this dog is feeling. And they'll see a wagging tail and think, oh, it's happy. Thank, thank the Lord, it's a happy dog. But as I've explained before, a wagging tail doesn't mean a happy dog. And the second thing is, Considering this dog's breed, it's going to be a relatively short tail. Um, well, you'd expect it to be anyway. And the problem with a short tail, naturally, or docked short tail, um, is that it can be really difficult to interpret a dog's behaviour from that. And I wanted to use magic because I promised him a cameo. I mean, you can't add one, have one without the other. So here is magic's cameo. Um, so I wanted to use him as an example because he's a French bulldog. He doesn't have much of a tail. He has more of a flap, to be honest. Um, so <laughs> here we've got Magic chilled. He's in the kitchen. He's just wandering around like, what's going on? You're in the kitchen. That usually means food. And his tail flap is down. So it's down, chilled. It's, it's always down, which is nice for us. Um, but then after I wind Magic up to the hilt to try and get this picture and convince him there's someone at the door, his tail does this. So his tail flips out and sometimes it will give a little shake um, in anticipation. But can you see the difference here is, is really not that much at all. And unless you're looking for that tail, it's really hard to, to spot really. So that's, that's a problem with short tail breeds and some research has been done into it and um, how these little subtle changes in tail movement can really be um, a tell sort of a giveaway of how the dog's feeling but in these breeds with a docked tail it's making it more difficult for us to pick up on those little subtle changes in, in behavior so like i say it's the little things and then here's where bruce's cameo <laughs> comes in now bruce is the rottweiler and um, he's a big old gentle boy magic's a puppy he's uh, bruce is going on eight now um, and Bruce is what we would call dog reactive. So he's not dog aggressive. Um, when he's off the lead, he'll he'll have a happy happy run around with you know other dogs that he doesn't know. It's it's he's he's insecure um, is the best way to to put it. So here's Bruce out on a walk, 
and I've took him out especially to get these pictures. It's really hard to photograph a dog when you're walking them, by the way. So there's a couple of things that I want to show you with Bruce because Bruce puts it really nicely. So we've got that his ears are, are they're not back, they relax. So they're chilled, they're sort of flapping away at the side of his head as he walks. His mouth is open, so he's starting to pant, he's starting to expel heat, which is one of the main ways that dogs regulate their body temperature, and it's expected on a walk. Depending on breed again, breed specifics there. His tail is low, it's not tucked under his rump, it's not held tightly to his body, it's just gently swishing as he walks, so it's, it's not tense or anything like that. Fast forward 15 seconds, if that. And Bruce has heard our neighbour's dog, Marley, at the gate. So this happens in a flash. You, you almost wouldn't notice it, apart from the fact he's a, a 45 kilo dog pulling you in a certain direction. So his ears are forward um, and they are really pushed forward to the front of his head. They're up and they're pushed forward. His mouth is closed. Now, don't be fooled that it is the holty that is closing his mouth here. Bruce's mouth will close if he's if he's got a relaxed halty. It, it will close. It will go from that open, relaxed panting and it will close and fixate, much like we saw in the Jack Russell in the last video clip. His tail has gone from sort of relaxed and low and it's now straight up, held high. He's staring, and this is that fixation that I was talking about. He's staring at our neighbour's gate, which Marley is behind. And no matter what we do with Bruce here, um, in terms of we can hold a treat directly in front of his nose, we can wave our hand in front of his face, we can call his name, nothing will snap him out of this because he is fixated on that gate. The only thing that I do, which does help break his fixation for a split second, is to place my hand on top of his head and I make contact with both of his ears. And it, it's sort of like you're petting them. It's not hard or anything like that, but you touch both ears and it breaks his concentration for a second and then you reward him. So the minute he's not fixated, you're rewarding that behaviour. Okay, so. I use Bruce there because he's a really nice example and a really personal example as well of how a dog's behaviour can change in a split second. And it's nice when you can get pictures like that. And it took me a long while to get those pictures, really. And um, it's nice when you've got those pictures and you can retrospectively look back on it and go, oh, yeah, I see now how his mouth closed at that instance when when that dog came down the road. Oh, and oh, I noticed when his tail came up. So I stopped and waited till it went back down. But it's not a real life situation, is it? Because this happens in a split second in real life. So what I wanted to do now was show you some video footage and it's just footage that I found today randomly on YouTube that I've just stuck in um, just, just to show you what it's like, what it would be like in real life and the sort of things that you want to look for um, sort of in real time. So here, this is gorgeous walking behaviour. Oh, just before we continue, I better say this is going to be pretty quick, as I say, because it's it happens so quickly. You're just going to hear me talk and talk and talk. So bear with me. This will be quick. So we've got really nice, relaxed ears, mouth open and a really nice, steady walk. Really nice example of relaxed walk there. This is a nice interaction. So we've got quite a stimulated dog here is excited um, but there's no real rudeness or anything. Dogs sniff, they say hello and then they leave. These two here, typical play, so dogs will grapple when they play, providing that they both, this guy's a bit shocked here, providing, providing that they both want to grapple, they'll grapple and then they'll start to play but you'll see here, classic play bowing, that's what people were picking out up on earlier, the play bow, that's telling another dog they're happy to play and they want to have a go. Um, so I just want to, that was very, very quick, I know, so I'm going to go back through it. So here are these two, these two have already decided they're going to play, so they're going to have a bit of a grapple, and then they both go away from each other, that's important. And then they're going to come back and they're going to show each other that they want to play with a play bow. Play bow, play bow. And that says, whatever happens next, it's not confrontational, I just want to play. So I'm sorry if that was quick, <laughs> um, but I'm going to show you another one. Now, 
there's a couple of different dogs in this one um, and I am going to focus on one in particular. There's a lovely Rottweiler at the beginning which I wanted to put in uh, which shows some gorgeous play bowing but that it's only very brief and then after that we'll focus on another big dog. I'm not sure of the breed, I think it begins with a B but it's a very very big dog. This dog in particular. So here we go. Here's our Rottweiler who's play bowing or play stomping. Beautiful example of play bow in there. This cane corso is not bothered at all. He's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I could play. I don't know. This is the dog I'm interested in. So this is a one-year-old, believe it or not. One-year-old what? I don't know, but he's enormous. So you see his tail is held quite high. Um, he's sniffing a couple of different dogs. He's saying hello and then moving away. That's brilliant. A dog should be able to say hello and then leave the situation. Having a bit of a sniff, wagging tail, lovely. This guy is a little bit intense, so his tail's held really, really high, and all, and he's quite, he's quite intense in terms of he won't leave the other dogs alone. Really, he harasses them a little bit. But this guy's pretty chill, pretty confident. Now the little black dog is tense, and I'd imagine that's due to the big one's size. So he's tense for a second. They sniff and walk away, and that's good because it gives confidence to the little dog who then goes in for a sniff himself and he's like okay you're not a threat let's have a look let's have a sniff but if we fast forward not even 10 seconds this is the white dog which is pretty intense so he has a sniff of the cane core so yeah all good Look how his behavior changes when he meets a German Shepherd. You see he's not got much of a tail, but it's tucked under his body, he's defensive, he's running away. And this changes with the white dog as well. So this, this defensive behavior is stuck with him. And any dog that approaches him pretty much now, he will already be on the defensive. And again, because it takes time for dogs to recover from, from that initial stress, it won't just go from stress to, oh, okay, it's cool, they've walked away now, that dog will be stressed for, for a good amount of time. So I know that was a bit of a whirlwind, um, and I know it happened in quick succession, but that is real life, that's, that's as quick as it can happen. This is a regular dog park in America, um, and you've really got to be that quick, you've got to sort of go, you know, race through your mind and, and look at dogs interacting and, you sh and, and be able to pick up on those subtle signs of stress to be able to correctly interpret how this is going to play. And sometimes there can be masses of dogs, which is sometimes not a great thing at a dog park because the control is just out of the window, really. Um, but moving on. So this is another study. And this interviewed, again, um, a bunch of dog owners, and it asked them to report on their own dog's behavior. So they took a survey home and they watched their own dog, and half of them reported that their dog displayed fear-associated behaviors, okay? But only a quarter of them actually reported that their dog was fearful, which makes no sense whatsoever. Um, if your dog's showing fearful behaviours, it's probably fearful. Um, so what this says to us is that even when we are correctly interpreting those behaviours and we're saying, oh, that's a fearful behaviour, we aren't associating that with a state of mind. And sometimes this can be um, a huge problem because we're identifying the behaviour and going, yeah, yeah, well, it'll be fine, I'm sure. And then before we know it, that dog's progressed up through the ladder and it bites someone. And if it's a child, it could be fatal. Is, 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 is the end of, um, is, is, you know, that's where it's going to end up. So what were the results of my actual study? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there were some differences um, in the ability of adults to interpret the dog's behavior based on whether they had a qualification or not and whether they had owned a dog or not. But as I said before, it wasn't what we would call statistically significant. So in terms of science, it just means the result is important because it adds to the pool of data, but it wasn't significant. So that was the result of my study. So that's pretty much it from me.
Um, I hope you've enjoyed. I hope it's been, um, on, you know, fun for you. Um, I did want to put more catchphrase in, but unfortunately my laptop was not having it. Um, but I just wanted to end on a little quote. Um, and this was back to the question I asked earlier, why dogs? I love dogs. Um, and I think Aldous Huxley puts it quite nicely. And that is, to his dog, every man is Napoleon. Um, and I think that's quite a nice summation of how of what dogs think of us. And really, we really don't deserve dogs. They are, you know, we are the, the be all and end all to them. So that's why I love dogs. Thank you, Stevie.